Where do I begin? Sometime in the year 2004, 2005, I felt like people were, were monitoring me. I felt like my phone bills were being altered. I would call and ask the operator for things. Um, I could tell she was, someone was speaking over her shoulder, telling them what to say. It got to the point where I asked to speak to whoever was, was in charge of what was really going on. So time passed and I was going through a separation with my wife, very depressed. I ended up staying in Morgan Hill, California during 2005, August, September, October. Again, I feel the presence that I'm being followed or watched. I come home from my, uh, to Santa Barbara for my father-in-law's funeral. By the time I returned to Morgan Hill, I felt like people had been in my room. And again, this isn't paranoia, but at the time when you're not proving it, it is called paranoia. In October of that year, I decided to return home for my little sister's wedding, who happens to be a probation officer at that time, is now an FBI agent. And I find a, a black sedan following me down 101 freeway. When I return to Santa Barbara, I go to the police station to make a complaint. Just out of the blue, I felt that they were the, the, the people who were doing this. And there's four black sedans like the one that followed me. I was not prepared for what was about to happen. Because of my, my insistence that I wanted to find out why I was being followed, uh, the Santa Barbara police had no choice but to try to ruin my credibility. One way they did that was by de uh, detaining me on a 5150 hold that I had cleared. No drug te the drug tests were negative or clear. They held me for three days against my will. During the, my stay in the county hospital, I advised everybody that once the 72 hours were up, I was expecting to be released. Um, uh, after 72 hours, they told me they were not going to release me but they had no documentation to keep me, so I escaped. Um, basically, I escaped because I didn't feel these people were bright enough to cover their tracks, and boy, I couldn't have been more correct. I escaped, I went home, the sheriffs come to arrest me. I asked them for a court order since the 72 hours were up, they didn't have one. I asked them for a warrant for my arrest, they did not have one. I said, now we're in America, why would I, reach, why would I give myself to you guys without any legal cause? I didn't want to get beat up or fight anything, I went back. The next day they had an in-house hearing where I was found not a 5150, not danger to self or others, but I was destitute. Even though I had $100,000 in the bank, I owned a home on the west side. Uh, my dad came to the trial, they could have asked him to take me, and I asked for a writ of habeas corpus and it's marked on the document. Well, once you know it, the next night I was beaten up and rushed to Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. Uh, MRI was done on my kidney area. I have the ambulance bill, I have the radiology bill, and no one wanted to investigate. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. From there, we moved to de December 2006. I'm served divorce papers. I go to talk to my wife, uh, and it's, it's very obvious what divorce tactics are. All you have to do is look up false arrest for divorce, and it'll come up. Um, and uh, the officer was filling out a field contact card, and he was told to arrest me and charge me with a felony. The second time I'm arrested is after $6,000 is removed from my hotel room. I'm, I'm arrested at gunpoint and taser. It was considered a hot pursuit so they could uh, sidestep a search warrant. In, in Santa Barbara, California, if you go south 20 minutes, there's a town called Carpinteria. The Santa Barbara jail is the other way, six miles. I was taken to Carpinteria, held there for three hours. Somehow uh, $3,600 returned to the hotel and then I was booked in jail. This process continued until I had seven strikeable terrorist threats, uh, which equal two life sentences, which I was told I would be serving. Uh, during this process, I sat in jail for three months on a restraining order that the judge did not allow. Uh, the four court documents that followed during there, very simply, they're your receipt for what happened in the trial. The first page dealt with only one aspect, the restraining order that the judge did not allow. The second one was a felony commitment letter no mention of the, of the restraining order. Transcripts were altered to say that it was so. I sat in jail two, th almost three months. In the meantime, the divorce lawyer, and he's got a sense of humor. The divorce lawyer files a motion that I'm not turning in my, my preliminary declaration, whatever we have money-wise. He files the motion. He sees the judge. He gets the motion. He gets a uh, money san uh, sanction against me. He records the motion and the next day I'm released from jail. Somehow somebody forgot to tell the judge I was in jail and that's why I wasn't participating. Then we come to the divorce. Now I've done the probation. 
I'm fi I have a three-year suspended felony prison sentence for a misdemeanor charge. I have to take it. Everybody's beating me up and, and, and with keeping me in jail. I get out of jail. We go to the divorce. We come to the settlement hearing. And we talk in the back room. And when we come out, we are, we're automatically in the right row for the judge. It's a divorce attorney, her divorce attorney, my ex-wife, me, I don't have anybody. We sit down and the first thing out of the judge's mouth is, you all agree to waive spousal support. Now, none of us have talked to anybody about this. No one had even mentioned a word to the judge. So how he knew that was gonna be our first issue, I have no idea. So now I'm in the hole, I have a, a, a felony record, I can no longer be a real estate officer. I'm not allowed to drink, even though there was no, no issues with there. My probation officer is willing to let me leave after a year and a half of probation. The DA fights that. So now I'm looking for things to do, and I start writing on the Internet. And that's how we got here today. Keep going? Okay. So now I'm writing about my cases, and nobody wants to hear about it. Divorce is ugly as it is. Um, abuse must be, everybody must know that it already happens because there are a lot of losers in divorce. So I'm looking for subjects to bring America together to help protect me. To be honest, that's what I'm looking for, is protection, um, vindication, that I, you know what happened wasn't my fault. Um, it is a, how do I say this? I am not special enough to be the only individual going through this, and I realized that at the very beginning. So I would start looking on the internet, giving specific situations that I went through, and looking at what other people went through, trying to protect myself from this happening again. And the one thing I was right on is I'm not the only one who's done gone through this. Believe me, which is why Bill is here today, going across the country. So I had to start picking subjects to share. Um, I felt that getting the word out was the best protection I could have. Um, as I mentioned, my sister was involved with probation at the time and now an FBI. We have not spoken since this began. At no point did she um, lend a helping hand. In fact, she was on my wife's phone records during the whole process, which is rather disappointing. So I started looking into divorces and, and I don't get the response I want. I do some deals with the gang injunction and the abuse on the um, Latino community here. Um, get a little response, but actually I was expecting a little more. Um, then I hit the pension and all of a sudden the, the pension abuse in the United States was a hot topic and we were off and going. During, during my time of reviewing the news, I won't even pick up a newspaper right now because things are just so obvious. Um, tonight while Bill was filming, another person was talking about his wife and what they were told, all the corruption that he, they were putting on him was legal. And it's actually a, a, a mental state that, that the people who are um, being rewarded for the corruption they think they're entitled to this. So this is one of, the, one of the problems that we have to overcome is that it's not okay just because you, it's good for you. It's not okay, it's not okay. And, and that's, that was a big one because um, that affects your children, your families, um, the support that you're, you're expecting and the person say, oh no, the judge said that was legal. So th those are some of the things that you have to overcome that I've seen with my interviewing people. Um, I started reading, the, 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 there was one person that was beaten at a, at a bar at night, so I waited a year to find out which attorney they were going to hire from out of Santa Barbara. Uh, he went through the case and he said, Larry, I wouldn't even go before a judge for you. I've talked to Jesse James Hollywood's parents, uh, a big murder trial here, um, and they could not believe the abuse that was going on. It's one of the weapons that they use is they will exercise their powers on a public case so much so that you know if they could do it to them, they'll do it to you. It's almost like a warning, um, a badge of honor for them to say, hey, if we can get away with it with the high priced attorneys, don't think we can't do it for you. Then we, we got to the pension, and the pension is a real simple thing. They put out a, a little note for 20 years on what they earned. And in, 19, in 2009, the pensions uh, had big losses in 2008 and 2009. Santa Barbara County's pension 20-year record for average yearly return net on their investments showed a 7.6% per return for 20-year average. They were only looking at 8.1. So they're a half a point down for 20 years. They're claiming they're losing a billion dollars. The CPI index showed 
that they actually had come in a full point underneath um, what was required. So now they, they only needed 7.1%. So now I'm looking at compensating factors for the pension. Everybody makes this very difficult. It's not difficult. If you only need a 7.1 and you earn 7.6, you made more than you needed. But it gets better than that. For the, the previous 20 years, they were also claiming they were underfunded and making additional payments to the pension. So now you have a pension that made more than they needed, contributed more than they needed, and were pretending to have a billion dollar shortage. So I thought, how can I prove what every, all the rest of America is saying it didn't happen? So I bought my archive records from the state controller's office. I started looking at them and I found that in 1986, the Santa Barbara County pension was actually fully funded 102% with the value of $225 million. I followed the, the archive reports that I bought for 1987, 1988, 1989, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, and 96. And they all showed that back in 1986, the pension was 102% funded. The reason I bring this up, because in 1997, the pension was no longer 102% funded, but now showed 67%. And then it changed, it changed 86, 87, 88, 89, 90. The whole numbers were retroactively devalued during this time. And I'm thinking, how can compound interest, the magic, and the numbers that they were making? So we've already talked about um, 2009 in the previous 20 years was 7.6%. If you look at 2007, the 20 year average yearly return net on investment was 10.1%, a full 2% more than they were searching for, for 20 years in a row. Now Stanford did a test on the pension system in California. They used the number, and anybody who sees the Stanford uh, test, and it's all over the internet, it says that all the pensions have failed. Well, Stanford used the assumption rate of 5%. So the only answer they could come up with was for everyone to fail. But using Stanford's logic here, if, if Santa Barbara earned twice what they wanted, Stanford had them at 55%, easily they're over 100%. I mean, the math is what we need to look at and not the dollars. There's no hard dollar cost um, ever on these pensions given us. We're paying more than we want. Compound interest only works on the unfunded side. And it is related to the bench and the crime on the bench. So again, Mike Stoker is a candidate for state senate. He was on the pension, Santa Barbara pension, the Board of Supervisors in 1986 when it was 100% funded. Now he claims that the workers are getting too many benefits for their money. Judge Staffel of Santa Maria Superior Court was a Board of Supervisor from 1992 to 1998 when the pension was most abused. And so how can I count on him to represent and protect the public on the bench if he couldn't see the invoices from year to year had changed by 33%? Corruption, we have judges married to people running for state senate. Um, it's almost, when, when I go through this, it's almost embarrassing to think that I thought I was important enough to matter. It, it, my life doesn't matter to me, but it almost makes, it almost brings me to tears every time I come up with a new um, finding. When I, when I see something that I just can't believe. I don't even like to look at the newspaper. Uh, I write a blog, Santa Barbara Criminal Court Corruption, blogspot.com. And on the bottom, after every story, I write the place where common sense never goes out of style. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I, I failed college. Um, it doesn't take a genius to see that if you're paying so much, you're earning so much, you weren't present when somebody says you were, no matter how many times you tell me that I was present for that restraining order hearing, you're never gonna get me to tell you I was there. It didn't happen. Um, and these people don't care. I actually got a ticket for uh, selling alcohol to a minor. I knew I made the mistake as soon as they left the store. The dates were right below me. I looked at the wrong date for cigarettes. They came back in and uh, cited me. I was disappointed in myself because we, I really carded everybody. I was really bummed about it. Uh, I decided I was gonna fight it through the, through the records at the store. I go to the court and the judge calls the two people that have tickets for selling alcohol to a minor, I'm one of them. And he says, would you like to hear the offer from the district attorney first? Now I'm thinking they're not even gonna charge me because it takes intent, penal code requires intent. 
for a crime act to have been committed. So I say, sure, I'd like to hear the offer. And the offer was this. They will drop the first charge of selling alcohol to a minor and create a second charge of disturbing the peace and find me $200. Yes, a charge that doesn't exist without a 911 call, without a police, without a date, without an action. As long as I'm willing to pay them $200, they're willing to let go of the serious crime of selling alcohol to a minor. This isn't, I'm not the rare case. This is the norm. This is how they bring funds into the city, the city or the state or the county, is they're willing to do whatever it takes to commit extortion. And this again, another RICO act from top to bottom. So if we have doctors in county hospitals willing to commit crimes, police officers willing to take you back without just cause, DA's willing to uh, malicious um, prosecution. Santa Barbara County, I looked up the, the amount of felonies that they have through the state, and I found that 25% of the cases are dropped outright. So they're telling me that they're only uh, charging people correctly three out of the four times. I'm sorry, that number is just far too high for me to accept. It means that one person out of every four has paid bail on a felony charge that they didn't need, has had to defend themselves from work, uh, has, to, has to get it off there altogether. It's just a process that one in four should not have to face because that's how they're going to make their money and keep, the, keep greasing the wheel. I'm not done? No. Okay. Um, you just get warmed up. Okay. So... <laughs> question but you know all the stuff. Okay so here we go. So now I'm watching all the cases and I'm writing my blog and you know, everything's going on and I noticed that there's a double murder trial that just doesn't seem to be going right. It's the Corey Lyons is accused of killing his brother and his girlfriend. First trial is a mistrial because the DA asked the brother the wrong question. It seemed like it was convenient because at that point the district attorney's office had presented a poor case. The second case was again a mistrial because I can't recall, but I noticed that the forensic evidence was the only thing they had. They didn't have a murder weapon. They didn't have fingerprints. They had some gunshot residue. They really didn't play it off. They were losing to the jury and another mistrial was occurred. The third trial again was the GSR, the gunshot residue, and they obtained a conviction. Now, I started searching the internet for information to write my posting, and I found a website where a gentleman claimed to be the forensic scientist hired by the defense to prove his client didn't commit the crime. I looked at his reports. I downloaded them. Thank God I did, because within a few days, they were removed. Um, I don't know the process behind it. I couldn't contact the person who did it. I, I never got a call back, but I did save the files. And his file very clearly stated that Corey Lyons' gunshot residue test results were for that of a uh, possibly, all it proves is that he might have been around someone who fired an automatic weapon, or he might have fired an automatic weapon, or he touched ingredients that equal to an automatic weapon. The problem was the murder weapons were revolvers, and they give a completely different type of test. The man is, is in prison now, uh, guilty of murder for the revolvers. Um, and here's the issue with that. The defense attorney never called someone that he hired to protect his client. The prosecution had to know if I could find out in five minutes that gunshot residues have different uh, test results for automatics and revolvers. The prosecution had to know that. It's required of the judge to know that. But here's the kicker. This was, we're in 2012. This case was completed this year. In February of this year, the defense attorney actually wrote an article for a legal magazine stating that it was the requirement of him, the prosecution, and the judge to know what they're dealing with when they're talking about forensic evidence. So here's a guy who goes out on one side and says, I'm representing the public and what we need to know. And on the other hand, he's not practicing it. In fact, none of the three bodies of uh, judicial system practice at all. What hope do I have to beat a divorce? And, and the thing is, when this started, I, 
I was just amazed at how petty, there's no money in my divorce. How petty, they didn't care. There was not a dollar cost to this. I've also noticed that a lot of times people are thinking that this is mafia stuff where you have to um, pay for your favor in the court. You don't. What happens is it's a, it's a power structure that um, rewards each other for participating. And that's by backing the other one up. I actually called an attorney, another attorney on my case and said, hey, uh, would you review my divorce and see if we could pick it up? Now my divorce, I never filed a preliminary declaration because I was in jail. Um, I never, my wife and I both never filed a final declaration. We never did uh, agree to that through a waiver. Uh, her pay stubs were off a computer screen. In Santa Barbara, the local court rule is you file for divorce and then you take the person you filed against and you present them two years of your finances, including tax returns. The judge never knows about this. This is automatic. The first thing you do and you say, by the way, you need to reciprocate. I paid $10,000 for my attorney. I never seen tax returns. I have emails where I'm told I don't have a right to see tax returns. Um, so when you're paying your own attorney and he's playing with the other team, how far do you think you're going to get through corruption? And this is everywhere. This isn't just me. Bill's been across the country. He knows he's heard stories like this, taking children away um, with the false statement that uh, my first arrest was I came over and banged on the door and said, let me in or I'll kill you. That's on the police report. On the ex parte motion where they try to um, disarm me before we even get into divorce, it says, I came over, I banged on the door, come outside or I'll kill you. It's perjury. The 911 call transcript show, I've never said such a thing. It doesn't matter. It's what they could get through. Now the ex parte motion was done by a commissioner in Santa Barbara named Colleen Stern, who is now Superior Court judge. And the reason I came to look into when a judge needs to run for re-election after being a, a gubernatorial appointee was because when Colleen Stern was appointed Santa Barbara Superior Court judge, she told one newspaper she didn't have to run until 2012, which is correct, because it was 2010, her appointment. She told another one she didn't have to run until 2016. I thought to myself, how could a judge not know when they're supposed to run for re-election? Now, these things aren't hard. This isn't even difficult if we just begin at the beginning of what we're looking at. So I'm buying transcripts back to 1978, uh, archive funds for the pension. I look up judges to see who, who else ran, when they were appointed, and when they ran for re-election. So I go to San, Santa Clara Court, and a Judge Bonanno and uh, Overton, I believe, were both assigned, appointed the judge in 2005. One runs in 2006, one runs in 2008. In Santa Barbara, like I mentioned, Judge Herman was done, uh, nominated, appointed in an odd year, 2005. Judge Garcia and Eskin were appointed in 2003. And two out of the three run in 2006. Herman did it correctly, Garcia didn't. We can't have judges arbitrarily deciding when they're going to be appointed a run for their re-election. And the problem is, they don't even need a vote to stay on there. They can literally stay on the Superior Court bench and never receive one public vote. The process is, when there's a vacancy, the governor may appoint. If It can be settled through open election, but they block us from that. When the governor appoints someone, if it's in an odd year, you run the next general election even year. If it's an even year, you actually wait two years and run then. in. There's, there's no guesswork to this. It's, it's pretty darn simple. So if we have judges and governors who allow their, their appointees to do this, what chance do we have when we're being picked on by law, local law enforcement? What chance do our kids have when Santa Barbara's attempting a gang injunction? Now, I looked at the budget for 2012. The first keynote on the DA's budget is that gang crime has increased 1,200% in the last 10 years. I'm thinking, oh gosh, what are we gonna do? So I look up the rest of the thing, the rest of the budget, and it states that Santa Barbara County, DA's office has handled over 12,000 felony cases for that year. And that their office has also handled 367 cases that have the word gang attached to them. Doesn't say if it's a misdemeanors or felony, but they got 367. Now, I'm not that bright, but when I divided 
12,600 and whatever against 367. I came out with point zero 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 one. And I'm the number one target on the list is our Hispanic youth. I'm not that bright, people, but I mean, and it, the, the problem isn't just that they pick on, it's the amount of money that we account to the gang issue. Whether it's, we, we pay them through probation, youth. We pay them through the uh, juvenile facilities that hold them. We pay them through the outreach that holds them, law enforcement that takes care of them. But we don't need extra money for the other 12,000 people. I don't know. Color me stupid, but something doesn't add up there. And it's just a political ploy. And get off the backs of our kids. You know, I have a friend here. He is the number one environmental protection attorney in the United States Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., Santa, former Santa Barbara gang member. I have another friend that ran for city council here. Um, if you had taken a look at our eighth grade pictures, we're both wearing hush puppies. We both have our, our corduroys creased nice and neat. We're both wearing J.C. Penny white t-shirts. I wasn't allowed to wear a Pendleton, but a lot of the guys back then wore Pendletons. I wasn't allowed to wear a beanie. A friend of ours to the, to the environmental attorney just passed away, another former gang member. 1,500 people showed up at a local theater here to say goodbye to him. Incredible. Judges, ex-judges, politicians. But what I wanted those people to do was look around at the other friends of my age and tell us which ones wore hush puppies and which ones didn't. Because that's all it takes now to make someone a gang member. Athletic shoes, athletic team sports. And that's it. If you're going to an office, I love ties. Just a little older one, but I love ties. If I'm in an office that has ties, that where guys are out there buying uh, Tabasco ties, Jerry Garcia ties, uh, I'm going to pick one up. You're not going to make me a tie gang member. But if I go down there and buy Oakland Raiders, I'm a gang member. I don't understand the process. We all do this everywhere we go. Women want to look a certain way, certain purses. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, the Constitution is a, is, is a pretty simple thing. Just because there's laws on the books doesn't mean it's constitutional. You can't make a gang murder with enhancements more valuable than a white, gang mur a white murder for the same crime, for the same impulse, whatever, manslaughter, whatever you want. To say. You, can't, you cannot constitutionally say... Larry's crime is more important than Bill's crime. It can't happen. Just because it's on the books doesn't mean it's okay. You're going after 14-year-old kids. Um, in, in California, you have the right to an expert witness. And you have the right to receive that even if you don't have the funds. Well, in order for me, you know how I found that out? I looked at Los Angeles County's website, Superior Court. Because Santa Barbara County won't tell you that. If you need a translator, they framed a 14-year-old boy named Ricardo Juarez. There was a murder on State Street. Um, when the kids were getting out of school, I was coming down, down to uh, Santa Barbara. I had a court order program I had to attend. And one of the days the kids were off, we, we heard that a lot of the West Side kids had went to the East Side. The next time there was a holiday, which is the day of this murder I'm about to explain, um, even on the bus, people were talking about, I wonder if the kids are going to go from the east side to the west side. A fight broke out about three blocks from where the murder finally occurred. Um, the fight moved another block over and finally ended up on State and Carrillo Street. Now, no police showed up. There, there's a 20 or 30 minute variance here. The police were having a special meeting two blocks further the other way. Um, the gentleman was killed, sadly, and uh, they arrested a 14-year-old, and within a day, they knew they were going to try him as an adult, even though they hadn't finished their investigation. Um, the murder victim was buried within 48 hours with the help of the community. The, the defense wasn't allowed a second autopsy. Um, they, they, they got the body out of there. It wasn't to help the family. It was to protect themselves. What happened was city council had taken $100,000 away from the Santa Barbara Police Department, and it seems like they just held back to let this, let this crime escalate. Um, there's supposedly DNA evidence. I actually have a paper here that says um, there was another suspect, but he wasn't old enough to be tried as an adult. He was two months uh, too young. He was granted immunity for the murder and then testified against the kid they were charging for the murder. So they gave him a, you don't get immunity for the murder. You get the immunity from self-incrimination. That's not what they gave him. They gave him immunity for the murder. 
uh, during one of the preliminary hearings, because there was two trials in this one, the judge actually would not allow the defense attorney to question the police officer on what was on the, the uh, transcripts during his interview. He said to tell the, he told the police officer to be uh, informed and rewatch the video. The defense was to do the same, and he would take the, wit the evidence home and watch it himself. I'm sorry. Chain of, chain of command, I'm not a bright guy, but how do we know he's watching the right video? How do we know he's listening to the same uh, verb, verbiage that the other ones have? Um, it's asinine. I mean, it, th that's what I mean. Common sense tells me that's not okay, that that's not how things work. Uh, the kid was 14 years old. Uh, they admit that they didn't tell him he was under investigation for the murder while they're questioning him. And the public defenders are in the police officer's lounge, but they won't allow him to speak. I'm not asking... I will sit on any jury and convict anyone who is just, justly found guilty. That's all I ask. Whether he's brown, black, yellow, gang member, non-gang member, white crime, not white crime. Um, and, and here's the insanity is I can sit here and quote you a million cases that I've looked at. There's one where a gentleman milked $3 million on insurance monies and annuities from people. The state insurance commissioner got involved. He was charged with 47 felonies, convicted of one. He, he had a um, leg brace put on and, and restitution. Now this guy, the state commissioner, I wish I remember his name because he ran for governor. So his big thing was to get one, one year, one felony, and the guy served it with an ankle bracelet. I can't make this stuff up. I, I just can't. It's just, it's sad. It, it really disgusts me to think that when I found the other day reviewing for Bill, I was getting ready, I was looking over my judicial records. And that's when I came up with the, the lineage of looking for the spouses or former board of supervisors. And when I realized that Mr. Stoker was there when it was 100% and he's claiming that the workers don't deserve it and that James um, or J Staffel, Judge Staffel, was there when the fraud was being committed, it, it gives you a sick, hopeless feeling. And it has nothing to do with, I haven't worked for two years. I have a, a work-related injury. Prior to that, I couldn't do real estate anymore. A wife cleaned me out. Um, I don't mind being broke. That's just, that's just the position that I'm at. But what's scary is I, I, I was able to defend myself. I got lucky. There is help here. There are good people out there. What about the people that can't? What about the people that can't see? I mean, my father thought, he talked about genocide in other countries, but no, would a judge ever do something wrong? And we still don't speak. Six years after the fact. It, it was just heartbreaking to think that if people really, you know, the, the reason that I, I write my stories and I'm willing to put out something crazy like the pension's not broke, Judges aren't running for re-election because if my uneducated, simple self can come up with these results, what could you do? What could you do with resources that you have, with money, with backing and support? What could we really change in America that we're not doing now? Now that turns me on. That excites me. That, that's why my grandfather landed on Normandy. I mean, what could you do Knowing what you know. How many accountants could come help me with my pension research and really blow it up? This money belongs to us. It, it, it's funny. Um, Wall Street took $6 trillion, $8 trillion in the subprime switch of hands. And this past year, the Attorney General's office was bragging that they got $50 billion for California if you fell into these things. So... Trillions of dollars changed hands, and we're going to get pennies on the dollar to help us. You know, the funny thing, I, I watched this real estate thing break loose. Um, and when Greenspan was altering the, the market to help the economy, he kept doing it with no foundation for his decisions. Now, back then, I was doing home loans. People went from refining every seven years to every two years, moving unsecured debt to secured debt, writing it off. But there actually was a safety net in the uh, IRS code that said, if you bought a home in 1980 and you're refinancing 
you can only use up to 110% of your new loan amount from your original amount, giving it a blanket. But what we did, what ruined us in 2000, is that law was taken off the book and people who bought a home for 140,000 now had a mortgage of 240,000, they doubled their tax write-off. It, so it broke the safety net that affected us in 2007 and 2008 and people don't even realize, had that not been possible, I don't know that they would have got away with what they got away with. But I don't know. Do you? There's people out here that can help us. There's, there's money out there. I would love to have a staff of five and 60 days to go at it and travel across the country and wake people up. I can't spell. This chart right here, I made this chart right here. And it said I'd use the Santa Barbara numbers for the pension. Now, the first 10 years, I came out with, within $10 million of the Santa Barbara's numbers, which is pure luck because I was rounding up. Who knows? It came in with $10 million. The next 10 years, we switched $2 billion. They say their present value minus a billion. I'm saying they're fully funded plus a billion. Who's right? I need your help to get this going. I need your help to prove that anybody can change America and all the ideas aren't found. You know what impossible is? Impossible means we just haven't tried hard enough yet. Quit thinking the president's the one who's going to change this. It's not going to happen. It says we the people. That's how everything starts. We the people. It's my duty. It's my responsibility to tell you that I didn't commit a crime. It's my responsibility to tell you when a judge commits a crime. And it's your responsibility to be just as concerned as me. I don't know. I need a little water here. I don't know. You can't spell. <laughs> well, no. Hello, my name is Lawrence Mendoza. I live in Santa Barbara, California. I have been writing on a blog for six years talking about corruption and personal experiences. Through this, I have uncovered some things that just seem incredible. I could show you evidence that the Santa Barbara County pension is not in trouble. I can show you that through archived records I purchased from the state controller's office in 1986, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, the archived records all show that the Santa Barbara pension was 100% funded in 1986. Hi, I'm Lawrence Mendoza. I live in Santa Barbara, California, and I feel like I need to share with you why I do what I do, whether it's through my blog, uh, reaching out, finding uh, Bill Windsor. I do what I do because, A, it's my responsibility as an American. It says we the people. And we're in an election year, and I hear everybody saying, well, I have the right plan, and I have... It's not their plan. It's what we want. And I have uncovered pension fraud, judicial election fraud, criminal court fraud. And here's the funny part. I'm dumber than a rock. I, f I flunked out of college. I can't spell. My grammar sucks. After six years, it's better. But the question isn't what I can do. What is it that you can do? What is it with your resources that I don't have? What could you uncover? I can show a $2 billion switch in the pension when everybody else says they're broke and nobody wants to talk to me. State controllers turn me down. Newspapers have turned me down. It doesn't mean I'm wrong. I found election fraud with judicials, with judges, Superior Court judges, not just in Santa Barbara County, all throughout the state. If I can find that, what can you do? And it's not, I'm not asking you. It's your responsibility. It's our responsibility. It's we the people that change everything. And we keep counting on other people to do it. Um, it's funny that uh, Romney said something about who's entitled to what in percentages. Um, we're only entitled to it if we fight to keep it. <laughs> I don't care what he says. If we're not willing to go out there and protect someone, even if you haven't been affected, and that's the test about all this. You know that what bothers me the most about how the, the judicial system violates the Constitution is my son serves in the United States Navy. We spend billions of dollars to protect that Constitution, and we're letting knuckleheads on the bench do whatever they want to it. And that insults me. That insults me. How is it that Santa Barbara County has the right to contradict the billions of dollars we spend yearly on defending our country? Um, 
I see a lot of what I consider the United States imposing their will rather than protecting us. And we, we don't get the same results that we did during World War II or the other wars. We, we always seem to be like we're entitled. To, we're not entitled to anything that we haven't gone out and earned. And we have to earn the right to close corruption. In order to do that, we need people to get involved. We need people to care. Um, I would love to have resources for two months with five, a staff of five flying across the country, going to new, different newspapers, challenging people not to look at what I have. I would love that. And I would love for people just to, just to entertain it. If I show you something that has interest to you, that has worth, share it with everybody you know. Let everybody become part. Let other people decide whether they want to participate or not. Turning it down, turning it off, it doesn't go away. Um, I consider right now that corruption affects people in the way when AIDS was first called an epidemic, and I'm not downplaying AIDS or what happens, but when people, when AIDS first came out and there was a blood transfusion and someone caught AIDS, that was through no fault of their own. And it, and it was life changing. And back then it, it took their life. And that's what corruption does right now. Corruption is life changing and it will take your life away from you. It will send people to prison forever, uh, have people commit suicide. Um, and we're trying to make it like AIDS is now where it's livable, where you can survive it, where you can correct it. The laws are on the book right now. I don't need to create a new law. I don't need to go out there and say, we need to do pension reform. We need to do banking reform. The banking reform, I was looking at, at, at some things on, on Wall Street and I noticed that there was a lot of firms taking their business out of the United States. So I knew the banking bill was gonna say that we'll protect anything here, but under this specific category, we're not going to have any jurisdiction because they took it offshore. We told them what they had to do to keep doing what they're doing. We didn't change anything. We just changed zip codes. That's not protecting us. And if I can read something that obvious and write about it, what are all you smart people out there not doing? I mean, there's got to be a way to get other people involved. And you don't have to be smart. I'm Example right here. It's just a little bit of effort starting at the beginning. And does it make sense? Common sense. Boom.